managing urban spaces for pollinators, but I've specifically focused in on butterflies. According to the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme that have published scientific papers about urban butterflies specifically, there are 28 urban butterflies. I'm going to begin by running through the 28, just so that we're all on the same page. We all know exactly the species we're talking about. Peridiae, so we've got orange tip, brimstone, large white, small white, green vein white. And then we've got the nymphalids. So we're talking about small tortoiseshell, peacock, Red Admiral, comma, and the migratory painted lady, the Hesperidiae, it's the skippers, it's dingy, Essex, grizzled, large, and small skipper, marbled white, small heath, speckled wood, war brown, meadow brown, gatekeeper, and ringlet, and purple hair streak green hair streak small copper common blue olly blue and brown argus so these are considered to be our 28 urban butterflies i i don't think it's an exhaustive list i know that on the weymouth relief road in dorset where they did some serious landscaping for the olympics they've got a lovely colony of urban small blues i've worked to mitigate the destruction of a colony of small blues here in Bristol. There'll be certain species that we could put on the urban list, I think, but for now we're concentrating on these 28 urban butterflies, mainly because a lot of research has been done and I've got figures about their declines. So how are they doing? Those declines are specific to urban environments. So let's go starting at top left, we've got the small skipper there i'm not going to go through for every one of the 28 but this is just a sort of snapshot of how some of these butterflies are doing so small skipper down 86.9 percent since 1980 and that that's a figure from between 1980 to 2014 an 86.9 percent decrease small copper this is a figure between 1995 and 2014. It's a decrease of 75%. Large skipper down 75.2% since 1980. Small tortoise shell is an interesting one. It's interesting because it's also connected with a parasite. It's not just about habitat loss, this one. There is this um, parasite called Sturmia bella, which is a fly and it lays its eggs on the um, food plant of the larva, which of course is nettle, and the larva ingests the uh, parasitic eggs of the fly. So it's even sparked an entirely new behaviour. What we're finding is that small tortoise shells now are going into hibernation earlier because Sturmia bella has put a selection pressure on them. And so the ones that were predisposed to early hibernation are going into hibernation so when we see a drop off in small tortoise shells in the big butterfly count, as we have been doing, it may be that they're actually in, in hibernation. So that's quite an interesting case. But nevertheless, we think there's been an 87.3% decline since 1995 up until 2014. Um, small white, there's only two butterflies that have actually improved in numbers at all in the two data sets that I've been looking at. Small white is one of them. It's up 9.8% since 1980, but between 1995 and 2014, the population, even though it went up by 9.8%, that total population has crashed by 20.2%. And a similar story, you can see the, the other butterflies there and that they, they've decreased considerably between 1995 and 2014. In fact, every single um, of the 28 urban butterflies has shown some sort of decrease. The only one that's doing well currently, or it was doing well up until 2014, is the comma butterfly. But even that, between 1980 and 2014, it showed a 27.1% uh, decrease, but between 1995 and 2014, 
it was going up and it had gone up by 10%. So it's pretty tragic really that out of 28 urban butterflies, only one of the urban butterflies is on an upward trajectory in terms of population. So why are the declines happening? Well, um, they say a picture paints a thousand words and how many times have we seen an area of grass that's been cut and left to look like this? And I'm going to unpack this for us here. For those of you that have been out onto a reserve like this beautiful reserve full of cowslips, you, you'll be well aware that floristic diversity, the diversity of plants, increases when there's not a lot of nutrients. And if there's a lot of nutrients, then you get your rank grasses dominating and that means that your floristic diversity and your floristic abundance the total number of plants decreases so nutrients are are bad news for wild flowers and therefore they're bad news for pollen and nectar and bad news for pollinators so what can we control about this what can't we control uh, what makes the grass grow well sunshine rainfall temperature we have no control over those things but we can control soil fertility. So in an urban environment, we can really control soil fertility. And we can do that because when the grass grows, it binds nutrients into its leaves and its stems. And if we cut the um, grass and we take the clippings away, so this idea of cut and collect, then every time you do that, you are decreasing the nutrients in the soil. The crux of this talk, if there's one take home message from this talk, it is that cut and collect is good and leaving clippings on the grass is bad. So you remove the clippings, you can dispose of them in a local hedge or a bit of wasteland. That's the general idea. Of course, you don't need a swanky cut and collect mower to do this. You can use your standard mower and then get some poor chap with a rake <laughs> to get a bad back picking up all, all the clippings. Um, but I did this with a group of volunteers in Bristol to nutrient strip an area and boy was it hard work. So cut and collect mowers really are the future on this one. So the long and short of it, well, if you um, mow and you leave the arisings, which is the posh word for the, uh, the clippings, you get the situation on the left. You know, tall grasses there, not many wildflowers. People are upset, it looks scruffy. It could cause a major road traffic accident because it's blocking a junction. Look on the image on the right, um, that's cut and collect has been used there. It's stripped out the nutrients. It means that the grasses can't dominate and it means that the floristic diversity has improved, which is a big win for pollinators. So thinking about the method a little bit more, and this has come to me from Phil Sterling, who's done a lot of this in Dorset. To begin with, what you do is you do three cut and collect cuts. So they happen in April, July, and September. So you accept your fate, really. You accept that, yes, you're going to mow down your dandelions in April, your clovers in July but things are bad anyway at this stage your priority is just to get the nutrients out of your site so you do three cut and collects now they did three cut and collects on this site in 2017 so by May 2018 it's looking like this um quite a nice floristic diversity you know better than just rank grasses but um crucially the the sward height is quite short from then on in, after you've done a couple of years of this cut and collect, or a year, preferably two, you then just cut your site um, twice a year. You do one cut in early spring, March preferably, and one in early autumn, September. And you're bringing the total number of cuts down from between four and six times a year. Phil Sterling in Dorset, his aim was to get that down to a need to cut just once a year. And you start to get some absolutely fantastic results because you've reduced the height of the grass sward. After two years of cut and collect, and then that new regime of a March cut and a September cut, the verges in Dorset were beginning to look something like this. Really good for pollinators so there we go there's a verge in Blanford 
uh, Blanford Forum after two years of cut and collect. So a short sward height and it's looking really nice and there's plenty of wildflower interest in there as well. You need to let your community know what's happening if you're doing this um, and not all of them produce this bounty of flowers. So if you tell people that you're doing something positive then people know why an area is being managed in a different way. So a sign and some basic communication is really important, even if it's as simple as um, something like that. Or um, the blue heart campaign, which is quite nice that you may be familiar with, just stick a wooden blue heart in the ground. And it just says to people, something's going on here. The other thing you can do is mow a path through it. For some reason, if you mow a path through it, people get the idea that the long bit is intentional. <laughs> um, once the fertility is reduced, then you can think about sowing with wildflower seed if you want to. This has come to me again from Phil Sterling. Uh, it shows that in previous years, they were doing six cuts and there are the dates for the cuts that they did in um, 2018 once they'd done their two years of cut and collect which was that intensive harvesting of the arisings. Now they're down just to two cuts in their towns per year. And of course, this saves an enormous amount of money. So one of these swanky sit-on mowers that collects the arisings comes in at 35,700 quid. But when you consider that in North Dorset, they were spending 36,790 pounds 26 pence um, per year on cutting their um, verges so when phil did the number crunching he worked out that they were saving eleven thousand and thirty seven pounds per year so not everything's gone into cut and collect there are still some areas where you do need to keep mowing because there's a risk to um to traffic nevertheless there was a net saving there of over eleven thousand pounds so every 3.5 years, um, North Dorset County Council now can buy another cut and collect mower um, with a trailer to put the arisings in. That kit lasts for between seven and 10 years. So you can really make a case to your council that if they make an initial spend, they're going to start saving a considerable amount of money and they're going to end up with, with assets as well. So there's a really strong business case for this change. And of course it benefits pollinators as well. So they've made some huge savings in Dorset on highway verge management since 2014. And they've even won awards. And there's Phil Sterling, the man of the moment in the middle collecting the award because he instigated this. And it would be absolutely lovely to see something like this happening in Gloucestershire. But coming back to the question of why are declines happening? Well, I was down in uh, Devon last week. I took this photograph and that's a wildflower meadow in Devon looking absolutely fantastic, absolutely alive with pollinators. I took that yesterday in Bristol. That's our wildflower meadow in Bristol. So um, let me toggle back. So spot the colour difference. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is purple, the difference is knapweed. And when I looked into this, so why is this urban meadow in Bristol not full of knapweed? It's got a few little straggly bits in the front. The reason it's not full of knapweed is because it's in a higher level stewardship agreement and they have to mow that meadow. So just when the clover and the knapweed is setting seed, they mow that meadow, which is absolute madness for any number of reasons that I'll come on to. But a big reason is because knapweed will not set seed. And that means that um, you cause the local extinction of any plant that normally sets seed after July. So this is Hull up in Yorkshire. And we do get fixated, I think, on the nectar, on the pollen, when really we should be considering something else too. Looking at those 28 species of urban butterfly, 18 of them, I've done some serious number crunching on this and I don't think anyone's ever done this before, but I've worked out that 18 of these 28 species require year round 
vegetative cover in a grassland habitat. So the grass has to stay standing or they're not going to be able to complete their life cycle. So now if we think county councils are cutting grass four to six times a year, in actual fact, it's surprising that some of these butterflies haven't become locally extinct and that they are managing to somehow cling on because really they need grass to be there all the time. 10 of the 28 species require grasses as a caterpillar. They need the grass to be a reasonable length. They need the grass to be there at all. They're certainly intolerant of this intensive regime we have of mowing amenity grasslands and verges. I spoke about the danger to knapweed of a mow in July under higher level stewardship, but a mow at any time after the eggs have hatched for our grassland butterflies is a death sentence because 12 of the 28 of our urban butterflies, all of these being grassland specialists, overwinter as larva on the food plant. Four of them overwinter as pupa on the food plant. So here's orange tip. And of course, what happens is the orange tips get going and then someone comes in with a strimmer and it's death to the orange tips because the cuckoo flower or the um, garlic mustard has been cut down and four others pupate close by so that's the whites the, the the white butterflies they don't pupate on the food plant but they're probably in the mix somewhere they might be on a a bit of sort of scrub a bit of bramble and if someone comes in with a strimmer again it's a death sentence for them two of the uh, 28 overwinter as eggs. The purple hair streak gets away with it because it's in an oak tree. The Essex skipper, you know, death to the Essex skipper because it's putting its eggs in a grass stem with the hope of overwintering. So none of these species can tolerate the grass being cut. Quite interestingly, what I've worked out in putting this presentation together is that actually we can manage for our 28 urban butterfly caterpillars with just 10 plants. So just 10 plants and we can manage for our urban uh, butterfly caterpillars. Of course, we need a flow of nectar that goes from early spring through until late autumn. Yeah, that almost goes without saying. But if we're thinking about the caterpillars, so if you've got blackberry, coxfoot grass, so that provided for all 10 of the 10 um, grassland caterpillars in our urban butterfly list. Nettle, that does for all the nymphalids. Uh, nasturtium, that does for all the whites. Bird's foot trefoil, I think that was brown, argus and blue. You needed your oak for your purple hair street. Garlic mustard cuckoo flower was for orange tip and another one. Uh, sorrel was for the small copper. There were a couple that used the older buckthorn or buckthorn holly blue brimstone and one that used rock rose. So if you've got those 10 species, then 28 of your urban butterfly caterpillars are provided for. I think that's that's really interesting when we're in a headspace of fixating on um, planting nectar sources. So what do we really want? Well, what we want is we want a mix of cut and collect and wildflowers with some standing crop that is left throughout the year on a rotational basis so that the caterpillars don't get um, mowed up. So, so something like this is absolutely ideal. On the right hand side you've got cut and collect and that means that you've got the short fine grasses no danger to people having road traffic accidents but then on, on the left we've got these taller grasses and they're topped but they're not brought right down to the bottom so that's still good for the caterpillar larvae. There we go that concludes my presentation.